message today is doctrine of Christ, not an element of disorder. And I take my reading from 1 Peter chapter 4, from verse 15 to 17. And he reads, But let none of you suffer as a murderer, or as a thief, or as an evildoer, or as a busybody in other men's matters. He said, Yet if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on his behalf. For the time is come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it first begin at us, what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God? This is Apostle Peter writing to the believers. First of all, I must clarify Apostle Peter's use of the word judgment in verse 17 above because that word judgment is one of those verses which misguided critics of eternal security use. They throw it at you. They say, hey, you say there's eternal security. You say conservation is, un is unconditional. Look at this verse. It says the judgment shall begin in the house of God. They begin to point you. That's one of the their, their go-to verses where they, they try to confuse themselves. Thinking they are trying to confuse you. And they tell you that if a security, eternal security was eternal, eternal uh, I mean, salvation was eternal and secured, what about this verse that talks about judgment beginning in the house of God? And the answer is very simple. Yes, believers will face judgment for deeds that done in the body. The Bible says you will receive judgment for deeds done in the body. But it is for reward. The judgment is the judgment seat of Christ is the judgment of reward. It is not for punishment of sins. It sounds like blasphemy. Some people have already believed the lie so much that when you tell them the truth, it looks like blasphemy. They have believed so much in confession of sins, believed so much in works, in self-righteousness. They have imbibed self-condemnation so much that when you tell them that the reason Jesus died is so that you will not be held accountable for sin because he has borne it, you are talking blasphemy as far as they are concerned. When you tell them that God says their sins and their iniquities, I will remember no more. You are blaspheming. But that is why Jesus went up the cross. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 2 verse 9, He said, but we see Jesus who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death. crowned with honor and glory that he by the grace of God will suffer death for every man. That is a canon. So, this verse Apostle Peter was only expressing his sincere belief That he was living in the last age of the world. That was his belief. And many of the people at that period, they believed that they were so close to the coming of the Lord. And that the end of all things was at hand when Peter was writing this. So you need to have the context of which Peter was writing this. You see that in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 7, where Peter said, But the end of all things is at hand. 
He said, be ye there for sober and watch unto prayer. So they, as far as they were concerned, the closure, the end of all things was imminent. But not so fast. The Bible says God is long-suffering. Not willing that any perish. God has his own timing, not man's timing. So Peter was actually, he saw the persecution, the massive persecution, the intense persecution and suffering that fell upon the church. He saw it as a strong testing of their faith. That's what he meant by this judgment. Beginning at the house of God. It is that intense persecution. It was not necessarily the work of condemnation as we see judgment in ordinary times. Those on whom it fell were being judged. Their character, their stand was being judged. The stand of the Christians were being judged. Their faith that they might not be condemned. Their faith was as as like gold being purified through fire. That's what Peter is meant by that, that word. And that was exactly the same thing Paul said in 1 Corinthians 11.32. I will read in 1 Corinthians 11.32 to show you that Peter and Paul had the same mind on this issue. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 11.32, he said, but when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord that we should not be condemned with the world. Paul was describing persecution in this same context as judgment of your character, of your standing. So it's not judgment or condemnation as many of our critics, critics of the gospel of grace will tell you. He was trying the reality of the faith of those who profess to believe in Christ. And it happens all the time. It's ongoing, as I'm talking now in India, it's ongoing in China, it's ongoing in some Muslim countries, it's ongoing in Nigeria, it's ongoing in various parts of the world, wanting or the other, trying the faith of Christians. Dividing and sunder the true and the fake. Separating the true disciples from the hypocrites and the half hearted so that's what this con judgment in this context is talking about. Let us pray. Father, thank you for one other time, one other opportunity. I crave this opportunity every moment to stand in the place where the light of the gospel is revealed through my lips. I dedicate myself, I dedicate my thoughts, I dedicate myself every week into to do just, just that, Lord. Let Jesus be glorified. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name. Amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. Now, moving on to our topic. The doctrine of Christ. Not for this order. That you are a follower of Christ is no license for one to live a disruptive life in society. I say that again. That you are a believer or you are a minister or that you are a child of God is not a license for you to live a disruptive life in society. Disrupting the peace and the equanimity of the society. The way some believers conduct themselves in their families at their workplace or even at larger society, leaves much to be desired. So oftentimes, when people react to this obnoxious behavior from a believer, when people react to this bad character, bad temper, bad, you know, posturing, such a believer claims that he or she is being persecuted by the gospel and for Christ. That's, that's, that's their fallback. And be after all, because I'm a Christian, that's why they're persecuting me. But there is a fine line between a natural reaction of people to your conduct. Conduct, your conversation. Paul calls it your conversation. He about how our conversation was among you. 
let your conversations be so that I become a sense as Peter. So your conversation, your behavior, your your posturing with people, there is a fine line between a natural reaction of people to your behavior and persecution arising from opposition of the gospel. You cannot mix the two together. There is opposition, natural opposition coming as a result of the gospel and your stand on the gospel. But there's also a, 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 a natural reaction to your behavior, whether good or bad. And people have the right to react. So that is what Peter was admonishing here. Or is admonishing here. He said, when your conduct crosses ethical lines, when your conduct interferes with people's lives and their own rights and privileges, when your condo crosses cultural lines, or when your condo is outrightly against the law, you will face the repercussion. This is not persecution. This is never persecution. So don't don't target persecution. When as a Christian leader, you choose to speak out against government authority. When you speak against governmental authority, it's good if you want. If you are, if you, if you so, if you so choose, but you must know that that is a personal venture. When they came to Jesus and said, "Look at this coin. Can we pay the tribute to Caesar?" The Bible says he looked at them and saw the. He, he immediately saw the wickedness. He said, whose image and superscription is on that coin? They say it's Caesar. He said, give to Caesar what is Caesar. And give to God what is God. And they left confused. They tried everywhere to draw him in. John the Baptist had been drawn in. Into criticizing Herod. About sleeping with him, living with his wife's brother. His brother's wife and all that and all that and that landed him in prison. Jesus was focused on the religious leaders, the vampires, holding down the people of God. That was his focus. Paul was focused on the church. He said, I determined to know nothing about you other than Christ and him crucified. So when as a Christian leader, you're also a societal leader and you want to play a role as a societal leader and then you make comments against the government in power, you make comments against certain issues, it, it is good for you. It could be bad for you. The consequences will naturally come. But you cannot thereafter call it persecution on account of the gospel. No. So in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 12, we see Peter saying, having your conversation among the Gentiles, among the unbelieving, that whereas they speak evil against you as evil doers, they may by your good work which they shall behold glorify God in the day of visitation. That's King James. Let me read it in some other versions, one or two other versions, so you can get it in everyday language. The Amplified Version says, keep your behavior excellent among the unsaved. Conduct yourself honorably with graciousness and integrity so that for whatever reason they may slander you as an evildoer. Yet, by observing, observing your good deeds, they may instead come to glorify God in the day when he looks upon them with mercy. What he's saying is that your conduct, they may be criticizing you, but you are shining a light to them. That the day God will visit them to touch their heart. Your conduct will not be a hindrance to them when they are going to receive the gospel. That's what this verse is saying. 
the day of visitation, when God will show his mercy on that person to receive the gospel, he will not be saying, if not for this Caroline, I know this is the Caroline, terrible woman, I don't want to be like her. So God, I don't understand this thing you are saying. So if I become a Christian now, I become like Caroline. This Christianity you are telling me is not the same thing. This man from my village that is causing problem in my village. So if I become a Christian now, I'll be identified with this man. You see, you have become a hindrance to that person from receiving the gospel. That's what this verse is saying. Keep your behavior excellent among the unsaved. Conduct yourself honorably with graciousness and integrity. So for whatever reason, they may slander you as an evildoer, yet by observing your good behavior, they may instead come to glorify God in the day when he looks on them with mercy. The easy version, easy Bible version, gives even more graphic. It says, you are living among people who do not know God. I'm reading from the easy version now. It says, so be very careful that you always live in a good way. He says, sometimes these people may wrongly say that you do, you do bad things. But if you continue to live in a good way, they will see that you are really doing good things. As a result, when the day, on the day when God comes and shows himself to them, to such people, they will know that he is a good God. Paul said, we are epistles that we have written to the world. As a believer, you are a pistol. You are a living, moving, walking, talking epistle. They will first of all read you before they read Romans. They will first of all read you before they read Philemon. They will first of all read you before they read Malachi. It's you they will read first. So the doctrine of Christ clearly outlines the conduct expected of a follower of Christ. The code of conduct. Not as a law. Not that you take it as a law. Okay, I must do this, I must not do that. No. But as a fruit. Fruit of the Spirit. Not fruit. Fruit. A proof that the Spirit of Christ is in you. In your inner man. Spirit there is as human, once your human spirit has connected to God, there is a fruit coming out of it. A proof of the indwelling of Christ in you. Those, that's the conduct. And this conduct is clear in, in all the everywhere in the New Testament. It begins with the home. It begins with the home. The pillars of the home. Wives and husbands are the pillars of the home. Wives and husbands. It's the first Peter chapter 3, verse 1. It talks about wives from 1 to 6. From verse 7, it talks about husbands. I'll just read verse 1 and verse 7 just to. Can, can, can do a deeper study of it. He said, Likewise, ye wives, 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 1. Likewise, ye wives, be in subjection to your own husbands. That if any obey not the word, that they may also, without the word, be won by the conversation of their wives. You can read from verse 1 to 6, study it. What is it addressing wives first? And mainly. In fact, in fact that most, most of his admonition was to wives. Some ignorant preachers use that to whip women into life. And tell them, you see, he was talking about wives because the wife is the major problem of the family. Ignorance. Peter was addressing wives first because most of the members of the church, early church, were women. Even today, majority of the men, people, members of the church were women. If you go to Acts chapter 17, verse 4, he said, 
It talks about Greeks and honorable women, not a few. The church was women, majority of women. Say, so besides women and children, it's uncountable. He said, 5,000 men, women and children were like 15,000. And in the Gentile churches, was made, women were the major part of the church. In Corinth, in Ephesus, in all the places. And the worst is that most of these women had husbands who did not believe the gospel. Sorry, to say they did not believe is even an understatement. They had husbands who were antagonistic, who were skeptical, who were opposers of the word of God. That's why he says that if any obey not the word, that any there represents the husband of the woman. Obey not the word means they are antagonistic of the word. That's why it's critical that the role of the women, he was talking to those women, majority of them, their husbands were not in church. Their husbands were still unbelievers. He's telling them that you can by your conduct win that man. You can win that argument by your conduct, not by your words. That's what it is, what is implied by that continuation. That if any obey not the word, that they may won over by the conduct of their wives. It takes two to tango. Then in verse 7, he talks to husbands. Because husbands and wives. Society, all human society, all human society is makes progress on two pillars the home and the workplace. The home and the workplace. So, Peter's admonition was directed at the home and the workplace. The home, the pillars in the home are husbands and wives. Paul later added children later. But the pillars in the home is husband and wife. So he goes ahead to address husband. He says, husband, likewise ye husband, dwell with them. That is the, in, in, in women he said any, which referring to their husband. Dwell with them, referring to their wife, according to knowledge. Giving unto the honor unto the wife. What does he mean by according to knowledge? He's telling the man that being a husband requires knowledge. There are men who are still boys. You marry a woman first year, second year, five years, six years, ten years. You are still reacting to her the way you are reacting the day you married her. Then you have not grown. That knowledge has not grown. Even if you buy a car, and they give you learner's permit and you buy a car, they give you driver license. After five years of driving the car, you have mastered your car. You know the car. You know where not to go. You know how not to turn it. There are certain sounds you hear in the car and you know that this car, this is what is wrong. The radiator is having stronger. That is knowledge. So if you are marrying a woman, you must have knowledge. You must increase your knowledge of being a husband. Knowing your wife's needs. Knowing how she will react to this thing and when to say it and she will not give that reaction. Knowing the kind of information you can take from her. Knowing how to cancel her when she is in confusion. That way she can lead, you, she can surrender herself to your leadership. Not when you are not showing leadership. That's what it means here by knowledge. So deal with them according to knowledge. It doesn't mean you should go and then set up an intelligence company following them about getting knowledge about them. No. It means you should master the art of husbandry. Master it. 
There are things you can't say with words. There are lines you can draw. Red lines you can draw without saying any word. There are times you just become weak. Just weak. Mentally weak. Physically weak. Emotionally weak. Just to give the woman a win. That's knowledge. Anyway, I'm not a marriage counselor. Let me move on with my gospel. Praise God. Hallelujah. I'm not a marriage counselor. Let me just move on. If you need marriage counseling, just book an appointment and have your money with you. Praise God. Let me just move on to what we are preaching. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. Blessed be your name. Then he moves on from the home to all believers. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 11 to 17. To all believers. He said, Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims. <laughs> oh, Jesus. When I was meditating upon the word, strangers and pilgrims, I had a wonderful time today. A pilgrim is a man who is in a place but his loyalty is somewhere else. He knows his home is somewhere else. That's a pilgrim. He knows that this place is not everything here that I have to agree with or do. Because I have a culture that I belong to. That's a pilgrim. He said, abstain from fleshly laws which war against the soul. Anytime most people hear laws, they are not thinking about sex. Fornication, adultery, that's all they know about laws. They don't know that pride is lost. You can lost for your ego. Pride. You can lost for power. Just for power's sake. That's called ambition. Party spirit. Them against us or we against them. It's a kind of lust. I'm Democrat. I'm Republican. I'm this tribe. I'm not that tribe. I'm black. I'm white. All those kind of things also war against the soul. You are a pilgrim on earth. So you are neither black nor white. You are a citizen of the heavenly. You are neither Jew nor Gentile. You are the Israel of God. You are neither male nor female. Don't join yourself in all these male issues, female issues. Female liberation, women liberation movement, feminism, and masculinity. When I look at what believers are posting, recently, a woman died and the husband is still accused. Not jailed, not condemned. And people are writing, everybody is writing, everybody is making one comment or the other, this and that, this is happened, this and did not happen. You I ask, where is your Christian? Where is your being a pilgrim and a stranger? Where on, on which culture are you basing all this? Where is the gospel in this? I'm a Democrat. I believe in the right of the child. Right of a child to be born. Yeah, I mean, uh, right of the woman. What of the right of the child? That is breathing in the womb. I'm a Republican. I believe in the right of the baby. Once the baby is two months or three months, the baby cannot be killed. 
Yes, but you support adult men being killed every day by police on the road because you are a Republican. These things war against the soul. He said, let your conversation abstain from these things. Having your conversation among the Gentiles, that whereas they speak evil of you as an evil doer, they may by your good works, which they shall behold, glorify God. He says, submit yourself to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake. Whether it be to the king as supreme or unto governors as to them that are sent by him for punishment of evil doers or for the praise of them that do well. For so is the will of God that with well doing ye may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. Then he moves on. He said, as free, live as free people, but not using your freedom. Not using your liberty as a cloak of maliciousness. But as servants of God. He said, honor all men. Love the brethren, the brotherhood of the body of Christ. should be preference to you. Fear God. And honor the king. That you are a bishop. Does not mean you open your mouth and just utter anything against the authorities of the land. You may be saying the right thing, but the way you say it could be read as inciting public, and you will pay for it. This counsel Peter is giving here indicates the growth of widespread feeling of dislike showing itself in various acts of calumny against the church. At that period, they were, the church was going through intense period. If you see in Acts 28-22, in Acts of Apostles 28-22, the, the disciples of Christ were described as a sect everywhere spoken against. He said this sect everywhere spoken against that come here. So it was, the, the disciples of Christ were described as a sect of people, a sect that was ill, spoken evil, spoken everywhere, spoken against everywhere. What was their chief charge? The main charge against them was they turned the world upside down. Acts chapter 17 verse. He said, these men that turned the world upside down, they have come here. They were being accused of revolutionary tendencies. So that is why Peter was telling them to conduct themselves in a manner that is befitting. Yes, you have liberty, but there is a law in the land. Don't use your liberty as a cloak of maliciousness. Honor all men. Honor elders. Not only elder in the church, elder by age. Honor those who are superior to you in the workplace. Yes, he's an unbeliever, but he's, he's God allowed him to be in that office. He's doing his work, and you're under him. Good morning, sir. Good morning, man. Fear God. Give honor to the king. The bishop of your, your church is not the king of your town. The two of them are different. Give to bishop what is bishops. Give to king what is kings. And then he moves on to address servants. I told you that there are two pillars. The home and the workplace. So he addressed servants concerning the workplace. What? How can you act in order not to bring disorder as a believer? Because I accepted the workplace rests on the sound relationship between master and servant. So master servant arrangement, wherever you work, you're either the owner of the business, the master, or you're the servant, a worker. 
And even among workers, the manager is the master, the worker is the servant. At any point, at any level, the supervisor is the master, and the other one is the worker. Even among small workers, the head of the team is the master. So at any point, there is a master servant relationship. And that's what Peter is saying here. First Peter chapter 2, verse 8. He says, Servants, be subject to your masters with all fear, all reverence. Not only to the good and gentle, but also to the pro world. There are masters that are pro world. They can throw any word at you, they can call you any name. They can just look at you and hate you. Either for your tribe or for whatever. Or maybe you are looking beautiful. They are angry. That your clothes fit you is a no problem. Just your clothes. The fruit world, people who are fruit world, you can have, you can find yourself under an environment where you have a fruit world master. He said, be good, be reverential to them, not just only to the good and gentle one, but all those, those who are fruit world. Why? Because you are modeling Christ. Don't forget that you are an epistle. You are the you are the envelope sent into that place, addressed to that people. So other related verses of the New Testament for your further study, if you want to grab a pen and paper, you can read Titus chapter 2, verse 1 to 12. You can read Colossians chapter 4, verse 1. With deeper study, Ephesians chapter 6, verse 9, especially the Amplified. Of that, that verse, Ephesians 6, 9. Ephesians 5, 22 to 23. They're looking at Paul's version of this same thing that Peter just said there, and I'm just giving you Paul's version. Colossians 3:18 and 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 9. You can study all these ones to see Paul's admonition in line with Peter. And in conclusion, I would like us to read Titus chapter 3, verse 8. He said, this is a faithful saying. And these things I will that thou affirm constantly. That they which have believed in God might be careful to maintain good works. That they which have believed in God might be careful to maintain good works. He said, these things are good and profitable unto men. The Lord bless the reading and the teaching of the word. I want us to pray. Just begin to pray now. Just talk to God. I want you to just pray and talk to God right now. Say, Lord, thank you for making me an epistle making me an epistle sent to the world. This broadcast is sponsored by Grace and Full Missionary Association. GIFMA in short, an international Bible mission group. We are so grateful for your audience today. We welcome your comments, inquiries, and any other forms of feedback you may have. You can visit our website, www.gifma.us, or send us an email at spiritofgrace.gifma.us at gmail.com. If you need prayer or counseling, give us a call, 346-754-0720. Also, follow our Facebook page, GIFMA, that's G-I-F-M-A. If you're also a gospel minister, you can register there and get mission support. And if you've been blessed by this programming, send us an email with your name and address where you will receive free DVDs, books, and other materials to keep you growing in grace. Thank you. The Lord bless you. The Lord bless your bread and your water. The Lord cause his face to shine upon you and give you peace. In Jesus' mighty name.